What are you willing to open yourself up to? What are you willing to change? These powerful questions can empower you to dream a new dream and to reinvent yourself. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 156. My guest today, Christine Nielsen, is a speaker, an author, an executive coach, and a CEO of Contrast Consulting. She's also a stunningly positive example of this principle and how it can and should be shared in the world. During our conversation, Christine shares so much. She talks about how she has faced and overcome the challenges of her childhood, including being forsaken by her father who was facing his own struggles, repeatedly changing schools, enduring brutal bullying, and the loss of her grandfather who was her rock. Her story of resilience, reconciliation, and forging a path into an industry of executive coaching that was more than 20 years away from gaining widespread recognition and acceptance is inspiring. I find Christine's approach to life, coaching, and leadership so invigorating, and I'm confident you will as well. She's a true light with both the power and the desire to brighten those around her, and she's an incredible example of the purpose of our podcast, which is to show that dreams are real. Thank you all for listening, connecting, subscribing, and sharing. I appreciate you guys more than you can possibly know. And if, as you listen, you find yourself inspired to take the next steps toward your dreams, I'd love to help. Feel free to message me at dmcpherson at leadersmustlead.com or simply join the Amazing Dreams Are Real community on Facebook. I appreciate you all and hope you have a wonderful week and enjoy my conversation with Christine Nielsen. Welcome to the Dreams Are Real podcast, where we aim to ignite the fire that allows you to unleash your greatest potential. I'm your host, Dan McPherson, and I'm on a mission to help you own your story on the way to building your ideal life. The first step toward achieving your dreams is to overcome the momentum of zero. Take a step and let that motion dispel the emotions of fear, worry, or self-doubt. No matter where you are in your life or your career, only you can make that choice. The good news, you've got this. Why? Because dreams are real. Let's dive in. Hello and welcome to the Dreams Are Real podcast. Our guest today is Christine Nielsen. Christine has a smile that lights up a room. She has a voice and a story that does the same. She is a business coach, a speaker, an author, and the CEO of Contrast Consulting, and so much more, really. We're going to dig in and find that out. Welcome, Christine. Thank you so much, Dan. I'm so thrilled to be here today. I am thrilled to have you, and I love that we met almost by chance, it feels like, but I, I don't know that I believe in chance I, I, or coincidence. It We met because we were meant to, and we we as we listened to each other, we looked and said, we have to talk, and as we talked, I knew that we had to bring you here. So as we have done on this show so many times. We tell people's stories, but we like to start by figuring out what it is that our guests do in the world. So when someone comes up to you and you meet them on the street, how, and they, and they say, they say, Christine, what do you do? How do you respond? It depends on who's asking, to be quite honest with you. Uh, if I meet random strangers at an event, I will often say I run a boutique consulting company that is geared towards changing people's lives and helping businesses succeed. If you were to meet me at a hockey game, for instance, with my child, I may say I'm a master coach. I help people shift what they're working on and help them perform better. So it really depends on who I'm talking to. And after 27 years in the industry of coaching and consulting, I say it in so many different ways. I don't even think I can keep track. <laughs> I, I relate to that. I, I haven't been doing this exact thing for 27 years. Really, I've had my company for five, but I've been doing, I, I guess, a version of it in different corporate roles for that long. And it's amazing how many different answers we develop to that question, how, how much it, it shapes to where we are. I, I, I love one of the phrases that you mentioned just a moment ago, boutique consulting. That's not something that you hear related to in the coaching world or the consulting world all that often. If someone says, well, what does boutique consulting mean? 
Yeah, I love that question. So what that means is we work with our clients. We use a coach-based approach to consulting. We pull out what is possible in the organization and we help companies deliver. We say you have all of the gold in your company. Whether you're a startup, whether you're a solopreneur, whether you're a new business owner or you've been in business for 35 years, all of the gold is inside. And our job is to help you mine that and get that out so that you can create the best results for you. And that means we don't lay strategy on you. We pull it out. We work inside of our companies using an inside out approach. When you meet people and you tell them you have all the gold inside your company, do they initially believe you? Are they skeptical? Where do they where do they start yeah, that process? They, so two things may happen. They'll roll their eyes and go, you haven't met my company yet. <laughs> you haven't seen my people. And that, that's when I say, show me a business problem. I'll show you a people problem every single time. 100%. And so sometimes their eyes roll back and sometimes they're like, I know, but I don't know how to get it out. Can you help me? Nice. And that's the fun part because that means they're really up for it. They know that their people have the keys to the kingdom. They know that they're disconnected somehow and they're trying to figure that part out. And when you're helping people solve things from the inside out, what, what does that look like? And what's maybe the difference between this and other approaches that you see in the industry. You've been in the industry a long time I'm, I'm, and I can hear the difference. You and I resonate very clearly and closely on the difference. What do you see as that difference? I just want to clarify your question. So you asked me when I help people sell things. No, from, when you help people solve things from the inside solve out. Things. You, Sorry, thank you. So when they're solving challenges, often the challenge they think they have isn't actually the challenge. Hmm. So sometimes they'll present with, this is my problem, my people aren't engaged, and I can't get them to perform at a high enough level. Right. And what we actually uncover is that their people are incredibly engaged, and they don't know what to work on. And they're not clear about their accountabilities and how to position their superpowers inside of what their job is or they're me they may be measured wrong. So maybe they feel stifled or they don't have the creative power to change something. So there's so many different layers to what the problem actually is, and it usually is not the one that presents itself. Yeah, I, I love that. And I, I think so many times that as, as leaders, we look and we feel the symptom or we feel the pain. So we call out the symptom rather than stepping in and diagnosing the problem and using your example. I was picturing someone that you want to swim from this Island to the next one, but you have them in a swimming pool right. and they're, they're never going to get there. Right. Yeah, exactly. And once your clients start to see, hey, this is a people problem. That was the first thing you said. And secondly, I've got them maybe not not connected. They're not knowing where they're going. I've got to get them out of the swimming pool, to use my example. What happens then? Is it is it just escalation to the stars? Is that the first step in a bigger process? How does that work? Typically, the first step is actually realizing they may be the problem. Right. So in any leadership role, when we work with companies, whether they're large or small size companies, usually the person coming to us has the challenge and the problem, and they know they have a problem, but they feel like they don't know how to shift it. And mo more often than not, they don't recognize, they recognize some of the problem might be over here with them but they don't recognize how much of the problem sits with them mm -hmm. and the challenges that they solve. So they think it's outside of them. So first we get them to start to look internally at how they're perceiving things, what their big challenges are, what do they really want? And I will tell you, answering the question, what do you really want is one of the biggest challenges for people. They will rhyme off a list of what they don't want first. <laughs> and so true. So that tells you that without the clarity of what they want, it's really hard to lead people if you don't know what you want, let alone where you're going. 
also a fair sign that we've spent our lives running away from pain rather than figuring out where we're really trying to go. I, a lot of my initial work with clients and, and just otherwise is b- around helping people find their North Star and mm-hmm. find what it is that they're drawn toward and, and not that to use your example from earlier, not that initial answer, not that thing that that they say, oh, I, you know, I I want a hundred thousand dollars or I want to get my company to a million dollars. Well, why do you want that? Where are you going? What are you going to do with that? And taking it to that step until they know where they're going, I find that transforms everything once they once they have a destination. I think it's less the destination and more the reason why. Right. Fair enough. Yeah. I guess that's more what I mean. The the purpose. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think often we think our purpose is one thing. <laughs> and when right. we really uncover the value and the importance, like when you really drill down into why is it important that you accomplish what it is that you say you want to accomplish? Why is this vision important? What difference will it make or what impact will it make? That's where the real transformation starts to begin because most of the time leaders human beings you know executives business owners we're actually challenged with what i would call validating and value and when we tap into why things are important to us we are validated and we know where our value lies validating and value i love it and that that connection feels like you're you're almost pulling a resonant chord, a string that starts playing music a little bit into not to be not to be too ephemeral, but plays a little music in their soul and and now starts to play the the song that that brings others in as well. Yeah, it's really the sparking the fire. It's the catalyst. It's being able to have them let let go of the guard, let go of putting on a mask for other people, for what other people will think about them if they have a big, fat, hairy, audacious dream that they want to accomplish. And they're so afraid of letting people know because they don't want them to laugh at them or think them, you know, ridiculous for even thinking that that's a possibility. So it's having to let go of all the guard, all of the things, the the things that we put up to protect ourselves from a very, very young age. So we have to get through all of that to get to the heart of it. And then we can create what's so. So powerful. We can, we get through that. We, you, you've done a lot of work when you get through that, right? You've, you, yeah. you've broken through some really big stuff. That's, that's super important. The most people I think don't even recognize is there much less that they need to break through it. And then that when they actually do the freedom that comes from it. And I, I guess that's one of my last questions related to this is, is do you find that f- the feeling of freedom is one of the big results that, that people get from breaking through that? Or is it something else? I find there are many feelings of freedom. So it's not just that experience of, oh my gosh, I they see something that they hadn't seen before and they feel lighter. They have an insight, but their insight also allows them to shift the way they perceive themselves, the the story they've created around their leadership, around their company, around their business, around their personal, whether it also impacts home, right? So our home lives, we're people. So we don't, you know, the company's over here or the leadership roles over here, and then there's home over here. We're, We're one unit. And as compartmentalized as we think we are, we really are not. And we may put on different personas and different, um, you know, you walk into the office differently than you'd walk into your child's bedroom, for instance, but you're still that person underneath. What's at the core? What's at the heart of who you are and what drives you? And so understanding those drivers and those markers allows us the freedom to use that language the freedom to create and invent anything we want that isn't tethered to some mischievous, you know, paradigm that we stuck ourselves in or decision that we made when we were eight years old that I'll never be good at this or I can't do that. That doesn't have to run the show invisibly. Yeah, I think it's so important. And and what you hit on 
about there being one life really, right? We don't have a work life and a home life. We have a life. And I, I, I say this over and over and I, people talk about work-life balance and I get this look in my eyes and they're like, I know what you're going to say, <laughs> right? Is that, is that, that is that one life and how we craft that, that matters, but also that you find this, this space where you exist and you make it, you really make it yours. You become, you get to the spot where you're not carrying armor everywhere, where you're not wearing these tapestries over you, or you're not where you're not wearing these disguises over you wherever you go, but you are able to connect to a great buzzword for the last couple of years, your authentic self. I'm, I'm a big fan of authenticity. I don't love that it's a buzzword, but um, it, it, but it is actually at the core of where we where right. we get to, right? Yeah. Is what is that authentic self? And I like to use the story of uh, when Michelangelo was asked how he created David. And this is a supposed, because I, I never interviewed Michelangelo. But so this has been passed down through stories, but I liked this one. And when Michelangelo was asked, how did you create David? He said, I simply took away what was not David. Mm -hmm. And David revealed himself. So that could be considered our authentic self is by removing what is not us, what doesn't serve us, what isn't really ours, what isn't authentic for us. So that beauty by yeah. subtraction. Yeah. Yeah, with that chip, chipping those away or bringing those out, it feels like we find success when we do that in a number of areas. Even if you think of something as I guess maybe somewhat related but more tangentially as time effectiveness and how do we how do we find a better use of our time? A lot of times it's by learning to say no. It's by, it's by learning to step away and say, hell yes or no is how I'll talk about it a lot of times. But we're, but we're removing some of those things that would be there rather than adding. Yes. As you've been in this business for a long time, and we'll, we'll jump into your childhood and the story that everybody's waiting for here in a moment. But as you've been in this business for, for quite a while, and, and before it was cool even, you were cool, I'm sure. But, <laughs> no, <laughs> but, but you've been in the business before it was and before it was as popular. What have you seen change in the business? And what have you seen stay the same? So starting with the change, uh, when I started coaching, you know, the response to people would be, you know, don't drink the Kool-Aid, right? <laughs> so people are like, what is coaching? If you need a business coach, clearly you don't know what you're doing. There right. must be something wrong. And there must be something wrong with you as a leader if you need a coach. Mm -hmm. Now you fast forward that to today, you wouldn't dream of taking your Olympic hockey team to the Olympics without a coach. You wouldn't dream of being a high performing athlete without a coach. So applied to business now, how would you lead your executives? How would you lead your company without a coach? So that's how it's shifted. It's literally done a 360. When I started coaching in 1995, 90, yeah, 95, 95, 96 timeframe, and I started professionally coaching the what we would have to introduce ourselves as is consultants. Tell people you're a consultant, not a coach, because the paradigm or the mindset of people was, I don't want anybody to think I don't know what I'm doing. I don't right. want there to be any cracks in the armor. I'm the leader. What I say goes kind of thing. And that is so different than today, where leaders now are vulnerable. They lead with empathy. Sometimes they actually have overcorrected in their leadership style where they don't lead and lead because they're afraid that they don't want people to um, perceive them as dominating. Right. Like so yeah. focused on consensus and so focused on collaboration that they miss the opportunity to step out there. And provide real leadership right. authentically when they if they have the idea and they have the answer, why wait for everybody's vote at the table if you already know where you want it to go? Yeah, and I, I've I've been an example of someone who swung that pendulum, and yeah. in my case, it was in my corporate career. I was I was definitely for a while the what I say goes, and I knew it, and all that. And then I received some, we'll just say, very harsh feedback that 
<laughs> and I overcorrected the other way to where I, I ended up being a mess, frankly, that just like an emotional mess that couldn't make a decision, even if I knew it. And I, it took me a while to, to find the, the real space where I needed to be. But I, I, I recognize that shift. And it's, it's been a societal shift as well, I guess. Well, it's, it really is akin to self-doubt. So self-doubt run riot creates a lot of different personas and different ways of leading. So if you have a lot of self-doubt and you don't want anybody to know you have self-doubt, you may occur as confident and under, like, you know what you're doing. Right. And you don't include other people because you don't want them to know that you don't know what you're doing. Right. Ego covering insecurity. Ego, Ego covers insecurity. And the other hand is what you just said is, you know, your authentic way of leading up to that point was past learned behavior. So you learned how to be a leader. We all learn how to be a leader. We, it's not inherent. Right. And so we learn it from our environment. We learn it from the where we grow up, our experiences in life, where we study, our socioeconomic background. That's how we learn leadership. And so at one point it becomes, oh, that must be the way to lead. Well, if that way to lead doesn't fit your natural leadership style, all of a sudden you're wearing a jacket that doesn't fit. Right. And it feels inauthentic. So when you when we overcorrect, it feels just as inauthentic as I'm going to tell you how to do this and you're just going to go do it. Right. Right. So that's where we get into trouble because they're both insecurities. It's it's all coming from the same. I'm not really certain. I don't really know what to do. Is there maybe a, a bit of a of a connection w- between the uh, between maybe a misperception of the idea of serving as being subservient and and getting getting caught into the spot where we're trying so hard to serve that 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 as leaders they can become relegated to the to the muck basically? Yes, a hundred percent. So that's an overcorrection, right? Where your leadership becomes dominated by what other people think. Yep. And you don't want them to think that you're not being a servant leader. So you become subservient. And a, an example would be in parenting, right? So as a parent, there are moments where you need to be commanding in your language. You need to tell your child what they are expected to do and when they are expected to do it by. Not everything's a negotiation. If you negotiate everything with your children, you may never get out of the house. Right. right? They may never get to school. Their teeth may never be brushed. And you they certainly probably won't get to aren't bed. eating anything, right? <laughs> They're definitely not going to bed. Well, it's the same when you're leading anything. If everything's a negotiation, where is your stand for your business, your company, your organization? And so there's a, there's, it's not a balance. There's an understanding of which levers you are pulling and you have to be conscious to know when that is. And if you're an unconscious leader, you will never know. And if you're more of a, an awoke leader or a conscious leader, you will figure out where, what levers to pull and you won't always do the right thing. You, I hope you make mistakes. I really hope you do and embrace them because that's the best learning. It's so important, I think, to connect those dots and and to see this the change this change in the industry, but in society as a whole that has driven it. What has stayed the same during this whole time? What is what has remained true? I think the thing that has remained true is that people are inherently curious, and they do want to always be improving. So we all know that we you know we know what we don't know. And we know that we need to go figure that out. And the more curious you can be and the more open to feedback and the more open to those things, the faster you can actually accomplish the things that you want. I think the other thing that is true and has not wavered in any way in my years of coaching is that people really are here because we want to make a difference. We get up every day and we do what we do because we want our life to matter. We want to know that the short years that I spent on this planet made a difference. We made an impact, however small that might seem or however large that might seem. 
And that's the fundamental thing about people is we forget that. Yeah, we, we do. I, I think that probably blends pretty well into where this podcast came into existence is that we as kids have these really big dreams. And then as we get older, they get pushed down and pushed down and pushed down. And so many times I'll ask, I'll meet someone and I'll ask them, what are your dreams? And they'll be like, wait, I haven't thought about that in years, <laughs> right? Like it hasn't even, it's been this tiny flicker and it's in there. It, it, it's that maybe chipping away that, that we talked about earlier, but it, it's there and it's, it's just so hard to see it pushed down. And I, I feel like a lot of our responsibility, yours, mine, others who do what we do is to is to take the shade off the lamp and let that let that light shine out there and and then see people light up and their worlds change because of it. Yes. So as as you look back at you as a little girl and you think back to 3 4 years old and and I'm curious what your earliest memories are and where you were but I'm also curious like have you always thought I'm going to go help people. I'm going to go make a difference. I'm going to go and coach people. Some coaches I find like that's been a drive since like day one. And some people came to it a little later. And I'm, I'm, so I'm curious, was that early? And then what were your first memories? It was very early for me. Um, I at, so my first memories are different than those, than that, okay. that point in time. And I remember as a little girl, I was, you know, I was a spitfire. I was hell on wheels. Like I wanted to just, I was up to everything. And I wanted to, I actually wanted to be the first female prime minister of Canada. Nice. That was was what I wanted. Like if people would, I'm going to be, I'm going to change the role. I'm going to be the first. How did that get seated in there? And how old was that? No idea. Probably around the age of five or six. Okay. And at the same time, I also, you know, my mom and dad, uh, I'm, I'm from a small, a small city. It's called Kingston, Ontario. So it's, it's right in the middle of Montreal, smack between Montreal and Toronto, halfway point. So my parents got married very young and they got divorced very young and I have red hair. So okay. it's early seventies. Having red hair was not cool. And having parents who were not together was not the norm. No. So I always, I started off from the time I was very young in preschool and kindergarten, not feeling like I belonged, feeling always something's wrong with me, something's wrong here, I'm different. And so I remember those were my first early memories. And some of those memories were, you know, my mom thought my dad was picking me up or my dad thought my mom was picking me up and the school would have to call both of them. And then a fight would break out as to who picked me up. And I would be sitting alone at the daycare often. And did you take that as, so my, my mother hid me from my father for six years at about that age, from two to eight. And so I, I dealt with a number of parental challenges then and coming back later. And there were certain parts of it that I, I almost took on myself. Like I, I felt like their fighting had to do with me. And, and some of it did, even though it wasn't my fault, it was, it was about me. Did you feel that as a kid or was it more that you just felt out of place? I felt out of place. I felt uncomfortable in my own skin. And I, I, there were probably moments where I did feel a little bit like they, the trophy, like mm-hmm. one of them would win out. There was always a battle and I know I felt split, always split with, you know, who do you love more? Neither of them. You love them differently and right. both the same, right? But now as an adult, I can say that. But as a five-year-old and a six-year-old <laughs> girl, I could never say that. I couldn't articulate it. Right. And I remember this one moment because you asked me how early was it when I uncovered kind of my, who am I and my purpose? And I was probably between six and seven and I was at my grandparents and my cousin was visiting. My parents were divorced and hers weren't. So she had the ideal family. Everything was perfect. And she lived out West. So we didn't get to see them very often. And my great grandmother from Belgium was also visiting. And I remember my great grandmother comparing me to my cousin. And I was older, but I felt like the ugly redheaded stepchild. Mm-hmm. That, you know, that those comparisons, I'm not as good. Like I'm the not- wrong part of the fairy tale. I was on the wrong side of the tracks always. 
And my grandmother was Belgian as a class system society. So, you know, my grandmother would kind of look down on her nose at me a little bit. She loved me, but, you know, felt like that to my six-year-old self. Right. And I remember being in my little yellow dress and my grandfather had built a swing and I used to swing as far into the trees and to, so my feet could touch the sky. And I had this moment where my feet were touching the sky and up there in the clouds. And it was, I cherish this memory because it was this moment in time where I was really struggling and I was really sad. And then I had this thought that God doesn't make any junk mm -hmm. and you're here for a reason. And my job is to figure that out. And it was that moment where I knew I was worthy or valuable. And nobody said it. Nobody acknowledged it. I had to come to that myself. That's a pretty powerful thing to uncover as a kid. And, and especially out there, like you say, by yourself, just touching the sky and, and that comes over you. That's it's a pretty, pretty adult revelation. As you look back on that, do you have any sense of like where that came from? The, the universe just reaching out to you, a, like a, a, a sense of being an adult a little early? I was an adult a lot early. There were a lot of things that had me adult up quickly. But in that moment, I really think it was just a voice, a, br a breeze uh, on the trees. It could have been being in nature, but it was my experience of being wrapped in a blanket of love and acceptance. And I, I don't know where it came from. I'm, you know, we can call it many, many things, but it really helped me in that moment of time. So after you had this revelation as a girl out swinging, did that change anything for you? Did that, did, did your world change at all? Or was that more the first step in a long-term slippery slope? I think it was the first step in a long-term slippery slope, but it was the courage that I had to tackle life. I was always full of energy and full of life and wanted to make an impact and a difference and, and figure out how I could do that more powerfully. And so one of the things that in, in having that, that moment, I think it gave me some courage. And you hadn't felt a lot of courage before that because you'd felt different and shunted. Um, I had courage, but I always felt on my own. Okay. And you felt Alone. less on your own as a result? Yeah. yeah. I think that's what I would call it is I felt a little bit more protected and um, not caring as much, you know, was going right. to do it anyway. Almost like more solid or mm -hmm. more secure in some ways. Uh, during the during this time, did you have a relationship with both your mom and your dad, even though they yeah. were separate? Yeah, so at that point, I we were still living in Kingston. I lived with my mom in Kingston, and uh, I saw my dad every other weekend and on Thursdays, and mostly at my grandparents' house. So I would go and spend time with my paternal grandparents, my paternal family, and then we would, um, then I'd be with my mom and with my maternal family. So when I was six, my mom and I moved to Toronto. Uh, my mom got a job. She uh, met my stepfather. Um, and uh, we moved up to the city, to the big city. When you heard that you were going to be moving, yeah, those are big things for kids a lot of times. Yeah. What, what was your response? How did you react? I didn't want that. I wasn't <laughs> no. up to that. Nobody asked me, nobody included me. Um, and, you know, my mom really tried to sell it. She sold it very well. Uh, she painted the picture of how amazing it was going to be. And we'd have all these opportunities and we'd be a family with, with my, with Papa Chuck, um, who is my amazing step, one of my amazing stepdads. I have a couple. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's a big nuclear family at Christmas and Thanksgiving. So we did that. And I did not love that experience at all. Um, but I did appreciate, and I, I was angry. I became actually very angry 
Um, I didn't fit in with the kids in Toronto. I struggled. At first, I was a shiny new penny. So they were curious about me. But again, the red hair, the parents separated, having a stepdad, nobody else had that. Um, that was Those were challenges. And so my temper would get the better of me. And I, I found myself into some, some hot water occasionally. Now, did that temper come out in in you screaming at people and you getting a little mean and you punching people? I'm mean, like, I, I, I'm picturing you just like stamping your foot and like being really unhappy with some people for treating you poorly. Sometimes it would be directed at other people, but more often it was directed at myself. Mm. So it would go internally and I would purse my lips together and like really, and then I would do that and people could tell I was mad or angry and, and then they'd make fun of me for that. So, Which made it <laughs> so much better. Circle. And when I was, uh, so one of the friends that I had met, um, they, they actually invited me to come try out for their hockey team. And I had skated, but I'd never been on, on hockey skates. And the way I could make sure that my dad didn't forget about me. So one of the things I was really worried about is, you know, my dad's going to forget who I am. Right. Because you're not right there anymore. I'm not there. And, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't a boy. So are you would, still seeing him or no? Yeah. So I would spend, uh, I would travel back and forth on the bus to Kingston. So my mom would put me on the bus. My dad or my grandparents would pick me up off the bus so that I could visit them. Was that scary for you? You're a little kid going on that bus. <laughs> No, it no. was it was exciting. It wasn't scary. It um it was boring. I hated that bus ride. <laughs> it was the longest bus ride ever, and you know it was only two and a half hours, but it felt like. But, an but it was like three days long, right? Yeah, yeah. I got that. And it, it my time in Kingston was always way too short, and it was never enough time to be with my family. And I really felt lonely, and I missed my family a lot. Yeah, that's tough. And so you're, so then, so you're in Toronto, you're trying to figure this out. Yeah. And how is school going other than you being kind of on the outside in terms of the kids? Like, did you like the studying part and the, and this, and the actual school, or did you not like that either? I hated school. School was awful. And there were things that I was either really good at, or I just wouldn't bother with. Okay. So if I was connected to it, I would work really hard and I would do very well. And if I didn't like it, you weren't getting anything out of me. So there was some, I was smart enough to not, you know, to get by. Actually, I was very smart in school um, early on, but there were always things where if I didn't care enough about it, I wasn't going to do it and you weren't going to make me. So <laughs> lots of challenges that way. I did well um, in school. You know, I wasn't like the top A student, but I, you know, I, I got by very well and I, I had good grades actually. Right. So you, you made it through, you had pretty good grades, but you did largely what you were going to do. Yeah. And <laughs> not what yeah. someone was going to tell you to do. Yeah. There were things that I, if I was engaged, I would learn it. If I was not, I wasn't going to learn it. And I don't think that's any different today. If there's something I'm committed to and passionate about, I am going all the way. And if it's not, it's like, I, I am not interested in that. I'm just not going to touch and no it. No one's going to tell you what no to do, are they? No going to make me learn that. And I don't think, I think that's pretty common with most human beings. Oh, yeah. It's pretty, yeah. I, know, I know I match it for sure. Yeah. That's a, the, the quickest way to get me to do something, to not do something is maybe to tell me I have to. Right. That's, that's yeah. uh, I, I'm, I have just a little bit of that stubborn I remember streak. Always loving like the first week of school where you got to get like a new, a new binder and calendar and you could organize everything. And I was really into the beginning, the start. Right. I loved the start. But then when the pages would get kind of crinkled and you, the pencils would break, the, the shininess wore off and I would get bored. So, and it shows up today, even as an entrepreneur, I'm a quick start. I, I love to start things. Like, let's go do it. Let's go do it. And I'm a big idea person. So I have these amazing ideas, but I need to make sure I have other people around me to see it through, to execute it, to I, follow I, up on well, it. Well, you and I are way too much in parallel on that because I can, I, I'm here. I can, I have the vision. I have, here's how to go do it. Wait, I got to go do it. No, wait, yeah. hold on that. Mm -mm, I don't like that part. Yeah. <laughs> Unless, the, and there are certain things. So the follow through 
is often something that I have to practice and constant organization is something I have to practice because that would be, you know, I love the start of the organization, but once it got dirty or messy, I didn't like the continuation and to put it, you know, like that. You like so, to set up the system. You don't like to have to use the system. Exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm the same way for sure. Yeah. Now, what was life like at home? Now you're, you're in a new place. You're, you're feeling out of sorts at school. You've got a new stepdad. You've moved to, you, you've moved. What is life like there? Life was tough. Um, my mom was facing her own challenges in life. She uh, had, uh, you know, a lot of her own family issues. She's the, she's a child of five. She's the eldest child of five. There was a lot of different um, personalities, a lot of abuse, a lot of different challenges in her childhood. And she moved to Toronto. I think she was trying to run away from her own past and had a daughter, you know, at 20 years old, she had her own child and that, so it was babies raising babies trying to figure it out. And she was such a tough worker and, but very hard on herself. And she had her own really difficult years. So there were nights where, you know, I would be playing hockey and she wasn't, she just didn't come home. So she was working or doing other things. And sometimes I would walk across the road to the, where we lived, there was a rink on the other side of the school. So I would get all my equipment on and I would go over to the rink and I would show up at the rink. And at this point, I'm probably seven, seven and a half. Um, so there was a lot of stuff like that that happened. Um, I remember one time, you know, the kids were picking on me pretty badly at school. Uh, there was a, there was several incidents uh, of that, of the kids being pretty nasty and, and really tough. And they'd show up at my house when they knew no one was home except for the babysitter. And I got so angry. We had this big glass door and I, I slammed the glass door and shattered the glass door and oh, wow. devastated that this had happened. And, and I was going to get in so much trouble. So, you know, there was, a, there was, there was bullying going on. There was absenteeism with my mom. There was a lot of fighting between her and my stepdad. There was a lot of stuff that wasn't working. And so I, um, and I had to always negotiate. So if I wanted to play hockey, I had to do girl guides. If I wanted to do gymnastics, I had to go to church. So Irish Catholic family background, um, nothing wrong with Irish Catholic family, uh, but it's volatile. Right. And it's not always pretty. Um, so yeah. So, so you're, you have these things that you love. You're paying the toll to get in, but in the midst of this, you're you're in almost a survival mode, which I I recognize a bit from my own childhood of trying to get to trying to get along. And what one of the things that you said really connected with me is that you're here. You are seven and a half years old. Like, well, you know, nobody nobody's home. I'm just gonna, I'm going to go do the thing. I got to take care of me. I was eight years old when I started being left alone. That I that I remember. I mean, I was alone some before that too, but it was, it was eight years old where I started walking a mile to school across a highway and railroad tracks or where I'd come home and have to make dinner for myself and take care of everything for myself. That's a, it's a pretty young age to grow up. How did that, how did that work in your, in your world? Like, how did, how were you responding in that time other than physically doing it? Like what, what was going through your head? How did you respond? I think I was becoming more and more um, separate and angry. I uh, Hockey was really the only thing that I looked forward to. I didn't feel like I belonged with the kids. And then we moved. So we moved to a different house because if you move, that solves everything. Right, of course. And if you move, that sweeps all of the bad things under the table, and then we can create a new life. So a new set of bad things. I mean, a new set of things. A new right? set of things. And when we moved, that's where things really went um, sideways because we moved to a different community, a different school, and I didn't have hockey because I couldn't get there by myself. So that was a big challenge. Mm. And then when in the neighborhood that I grew up in, um, there was a lot of. Uh, there was a lot of mischief. There was a lot of kids that would, you know, stealing, not showing up for school. And in grade, fast forwarding to grade five, so I was uh, 10 at the time, um, I, 
my uh, my grade five teacher uh, who we just all adored, she died in a car accident. Oh, wow. In, I think it was just after Halloween. And that devastated me because I felt like during that move and that transition into grade five, so I'd gone to one school and then moved into this new school in grade five where I didn't know anybody and I didn't have my hockey I had this teacher that she was beautiful, like she looked like a Greek goddess and she died on the in a car accident on the highway coming to school. Well, I and then my mom was also going through some pretty big challenges and wasn't really there um, and wasn't available as much as she tried. And this is my story, not hers. But it was I stopped going to school and my mom didn't have the capacity to make me. So in fifth grade, you stopped going to school. I stopped showing up. I would, the school would call, people would show up to the house saying, you have to go to school. It's the law. And then they would make some threats. And then I might go to school for a week or two or a few days, but I really didn't show up. I I technically should, I never passed grade five (laughs) because I wasn't there enough, right? right? What what did you do when you didn't go to school? Like, what were you doing instead? I have no idea. I, I had a Barbie house that my dad had built. And so this big, massive Barbie house and I'd saved birds. Um, I saved birds with broken wings and I would put them in the Barbie house and, and try to just start taking care of these animals um, as, as a way to distract myself and, and to do new things. So I played a lot with um, dolls and make-belief and um, did a lot of stuff that way. And so you, you stopped going during grade five. You never, as you said, you never passed grade five. Something <laughs> brought you to grade six, <laughs> right? You're just like, here I am. So what, what got you to start going back? So in grade six, actually, uh, I, that's when my dad, I had to move in with my dad because it was no longer feasible for me to live with my mom. She needed to get some help to take care of herself. And I moved back to Kingston in grade six. Um, My dad uh, had recently remarried. I went to a new school. I lived just outside of the city with him and my new stepmom. And um, for the first time, so in grade six, I started to feel, wow, you know, I, I started playing hockey again. I played on a boys team. I could commit to that. And my, I had my dad and my stepmom and my grandparents around. So I was happy. So you went you went from this complete lack of stability where you're not going to school, where your mom's in such a tough situation that she can't really make you. And you're, you're kind of wandering around lost in many ways to then you move back to where it all started mm-hmm. in some ways with your dad, but in a new environment with a new stepmom. And yet had a space to feel the first stability that you sounds like you'd felt in some time and started to feel maybe secure again. I did. I started making friends and I um, started to, yeah, have fun, but I would have a lot of chores to do after school. And that's when uh, things started to, you know, I, I actually was on the hockey team and my dad would show up and, and he would coach and he would work with me and I was um, playing boys hockey. So that was very hard for girls to play on a boys team. At so that what age. got you to play boys hockey? I was totally going through my head. <laughs> yeah, my dad. So he wanted because it was closer and the girls league was in the city and we lived just outside of the city. So I played for Amherst View. So I played that year on the Amherst View team before um, and I, I won the, the most valuable player or whatever. So you were pretty good. I wasn't bad. I was, I was pretty good. Actually, I, I was a good hockey player. Um, but there was also lots of challenges with that. My stepmom and my dad had a new marriage and they were expecting a new baby. So I had a brother who was born in May. And to me, I was so excited and elated that I, you know, finally somebody to love somebody who was going to be my own. And in so almost like it's yours, right? In some way. Yeah, it's like and I I was so proud that I could be this big sister and and walk them around and push the the stroller around the neighborhood and all the people would come out and then we lived in this kind of neighborhood that it was very friendly and and it was amazing. And um but I was still there was a lot of rough patches, especially with my stepmom. Um she did not like a lot of things that were happening. And in September, so the week before school started, actually, it was the end of August, 
I went to visit my mom and my dad uh, called me and he said, um, you have to stay in Toronto. You can't come back. Wow. So my mom said, nah, uh, you got to tell her that to her face. And it was devastating. It was like my world that had finally just been built back up was completely annihilated and pulled out from underneath me. And I remember coming back to Kingston and I, I didn't go to my dad's house. So couldn't see my brother or my stepmother. I went, um, you couldn't even see them. No, no. So it wasn't just, you can't live here. It's we're out. Yeah, we're out. And what had happened is my stepmom had given my dad an ultimatum, either her and the new baby go, or I go. I was 11. Wow. Yeah. So, um, it was a very, very difficult time. And I remember the day, you know, sitting outside of my grandparents talking to my dad and I remember him driving out of the driveway and he was devastated. Like he, he was so apologetic and he felt like a failure as a father. And I wanted to make it right for him. I wanted to help him. Right. You wanted to make it better. I right. wanted to make it better for him. And I just remember after he had left that, you know, there really must be something wrong with me if even my own father doesn't love me enough to keep me. So that began to shape some pretty fundamental beliefs that I had about myself and that I was pretty much broken. You know, if you're all this turmoil and, and challenge as a kid and this back and forth between my parents and then if my own father didn't love me enough, and my grandparents, his parents, and my aunt stepped in and they, they raised me from the time that I was 11 until after university. So now I'm in grade seven and eight and I have to, I stayed at the school that was in the area where my dad lived, which was a mistake because none of the friends that I had lived out there. So it, they didn't live close to me. I didn't make a new community. I was always straddling two worlds. And I always felt straddling two worlds. And I had more trouble in grade seven and eight. And then I uh, went into high school in grade nine, not knowing anybody. I went to a completely different high school than all of those kids because I was at a Catholic school and then I went to a public high school. And I didn't know a anybody. Completely different world. Completely different world. And, and not for the first time. You've been bounced no. all over the place. Before I was 11, I had gone to uh, seven different schools and moved eight times. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's tough to find any stability in the middle yeah. of that. Yeah. So going into high school, um, the biggest challenge is where I didn't know anybody. I had cut all my hair off, so I looked like a boy. I had short red hair. And I was short and I was younger than everybody else because my birthday is actually on New Year's Day. But back then the school cutoff was January 3rd. Oh. So I was a year younger than all of the other kids, not a year older. Oh, boy. So that was, they, that provided a lot of challenges in high school. I was the geeky kid that they stuffed in lockers um, that was raised by her grandparents that had red hair. I looked like a boy until probably late grade 10, early grade 11. Um, there was some challenging, challenging years. How did you find the fortitude to make it through those years when so many kids don't? Two things. I played competitive hockey. So I went from a boys team to a girls team. And I think hockey really did save my life. Uh, I also worked. So I started babysitting the boy across the street. Um, I started as his babysitter and he was a, a few months older than my baby brother. Mm -hmm. So uh, that really, to me, that really worked because I had this baby brother that I couldn't see very often. I get to visit, my dad would bring him for a visit once a week or once every couple of weeks. But I, I would feel so devastated that I couldn't have him in my life all the time. And I would miss him tremendously. And so I got to babysit the boy across the street. And then uh, pretty soon they started asking me, you know, do you want to bust tables in the restaurant? Do you want to help clean some rooms? So it was, a, it was a, a motel that was across the street from us. We had a big farm style property on the top of the hill in Cataract Way. My front door is now Arona, but, <laughs> um, but it was all our land, our farmland. And so I spent a lot of time 
on the land, uh, driving. I had a three wheeler. My grandparents bought my grandfather and my aunt bought me a three wheeler. I flipped it a few too many times, so it was taken away. I was a little bit of a demon oh, on it. I was yeah. gonna say you weren't uh, you weren't taking it easy going out for your Sunday no. drive. No, no. I was a bit, you know, give me uh, a machine and some wide open space. And I was gone, taking all that energy and all that anger and all that loneliness. And I was taking it outside. But nature, I spent a lot of time in nature with the, like, with the dogs hunting with my grandfather. Like, I, we didn't really hunt. We would look for things like ducks and deer and wolves. And we'd track stuff, track bunnies and um, used to save all the bunnies and, and the turtles and I'd save everything. So I had, you know, I'd go to hockey and I'd have to dump my skate upside down and all the chipmunks would have buried their food <laughs> in my skate. And so it was like, you know, they'd sneak into our basement where my hockey equipment was. So yeah, I was the girl who saved the squirrels and the chipmunks and the birds. You were like the Disney nature princess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you're still playing, you're still playing hockey, but you, you made, and that's a big part of what pulled you through. Yes. I, and that was it in terms of pulling you through, was it the, the playing and being able to get your energy into that? Was it being part of a team? Was it the competition? Was it all of those as a mix? It was all of those. It gave me a purpose. So it gave me a reason to get up, get going, get moving. So that sense of purpose um, I had to rely, like people counted on me to show up. So uh, it gave me accountability and responsibility. It gave me friends. And actually some of the friends, you know, it wasn't always easy years. So, cause sometimes those friends weren't friends and you're playing on the same team and there's like girls teams can be kind of nasty from, from time to time. So there's right. and things that I didn't fit into, but I made my way. And uh, some of those women are, I revere today. I love them immeasurably. So in the end, there were, there were long-term bonds that were formed there, but it was a pretty hard path to it. They were a hard path. Yeah. But so we you, were also provincial champs four times running. Well, that's pretty good. You, yeah. you, were, uh, you were a pretty darn good hockey player. Well, and then I got a tap one day and it said uh, from a teacher at school said, have you ever skied? And I, I had skied. I'd skied with my stepdad often. And, and my mom had been uh, on a road to recovery and, and my mom was also getting much healthier. So my relationship with her while I was at my grandmother's really also built mm -hmm. um, and, and became much stronger. My mom and I are extremely close. She's... She is a phenomenal human being. That's wonderful. It's we so... all have hard times and right. it's not that you do, it's how you do. And she really picked herself up and she recovered from her challenges and she ended up having my brother and sister. So I have a 16 year old, a 16 younger years, younger sister and an 18 years younger brother from my mom's second marriage with my stepdad, same that stepdad. And then my dad uh, had two boys. So I have two brothers from his uh, second marriage. You weren't kidding about that growing nuclear family. <laughs> You've got it's a, a lot going family. on. Yeah. It's, I, I love the, the love that shines through you for your mother. Yeah. And my mother had hard times for sure. I remember her selling herself so that we had a place to live and feeding me when she couldn't eat. And she made some brutal choices in life and uh, not certainly not all of them were good, but there is, uh, and there's nobody on the planet I've loved more than her and losing her 22 years ago was really hard. But to this day, she just holds such a place in my heart and mm -hmm. my life. And I'm here because of her. And I love seeing and hearing that connection with you. It's also, I, I think, a really empowering vision of a theme that we see so often in this podcast and in life in general, that there is always light through the darkness, yeah. that, that we all have darkness of some sort, right? It, and, and we may judge others and go, oh, they didn't have darkness, or theirs was less, or theirs was more. It's not a competition, and comparison is the thief of joy, but we all have our darkness. We all have our struggles. And Absolutely. it's wonderful that you get to share not only about your light, but hers. 
It's also, and you know, my mom is an extraordinary human and I, I do, I'm, I'm so grateful for that relationship. Um, but also my grandparents were absolutely pivotal in helping me and my, my grandparents and my dad's sister, my aunt, they really did raise me. And even from the early, early years, like I was always tossed around and I ended up there at my grandparents like more they than they did the work, place. didn't they? <laughs> they did the work. And it's important because, um, my grandmother, uh, when my grandfather passed away, I was in university and it was devastating, absolutely devastating. But before I get, I got to university, there were some decisions in life that I had made. And I had, you know, being unlovable by your father kind of kicks you in the ass. Right. And um, I had started to become, well, I'll show you. Don't tell me I can't. And I kept proving I will. And so I got into different universities, uh, but I wanted to go to Queen's University, which is one of the most reputable ones in Canada very high entry levels at the time. And it was in Kingston, so we could afford it because my family wasn't wasn't wealthy. We were okay. My grandfather was in the war and my grandmother was a war bride. Um, so we were okay, but they were raising a child that wasn't, you know, that was their grandchild. Right. And my aunt was very pivotal in that as well. So I worked all through high school. I either worked at the restaurant across the street or I managed a garden center. I loved, I threw myself into work. So I was either playing hockey or working, which did challenge my marks, uh, <laughs> but I made it through and I, I did well, well enough to get into university and I um, chose to go to Queens. I had no idea why or what the heck I was doing. It just seemed like that's a good idea. <laughs> but I knew that I was going to go to university because I really needed to prove to my dad, to my stepmom and to the world that I'm of worth. I'll show you. Right. So that propelled me for many years to, you know, I, I have a degree in economics from one of the top universities. Nobody else in my family had a university education. Right. I'll show them. I'll show you. Yeah. I graduated from that university and got a job. Um, and I, my first job was actually to uh, really work for a company that was unionized and I was hired to help Disem disembark that union. It was a sales force that oh, and wow. said, Can you help us. And I said, yes, I had no idea what I was doing, but I did <laughs> do that. And then very shortly into that, I got a job in the pharmaceutical industry. And um, because I knew that I wanted to make a difference, but I wasn't smart enough to be a doctor. One of the decisions that I'd made. And so if I couldn't be a doctor, I'll sell pharmaceutical drugs and help people with their conditions and, and diabetes and heart conditions were uh, familiar to me. So I, I was ready and I, I uh, got that degree. Um, but it was, it was a challenge because I still to this day don't know how I got a degree in economics. It's not my strong suit. <laughs> well, well, I suspect by sheer stubbornness and force of will, if nothing yeah. else. Right. But mm -hmm. You mentioned that as you're going through university and, and, and boy, your, your journey is pretty incredible, not just from the things that you encountered at home and, and at school, but also all the work that you'd already done, all the years of work you'd put in at a much younger age and, and, and much more intensity than most, you start university, you're going for this degree, maybe that, that is a little unusual for you. And then you mentioned you had this really traumatic news in the middle yeah. of university about your grandfather. Yeah, what happened? In second year university, I um, so my grandfather had had a mild heart attack when I was in first year. And so he, um, full, he had recovered from his heart attack, but he'd also been diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And he was 67. And he carried this dehumidifier up the stairs and I was all dressed up to go to school. I had a doctor's appointment. I had a pharmacology exam to write and then going to this appointment. And I looked at my grandfather and I said, Papa, I'll carry that up the stairs. All you had to do is ask. And I yelled at him and he yelled back at me and he got very angry at me. He's like, I don't need your help. Strong, you know, he's a war veteran and, and he built houses for a living. He didn't need some young 18 year old 
kid, 19 year old kid telling him what to do. And I remember stopping on my way out the door. And I said, if I didn't love you so much, I wouldn't care if you carried that dehumidifier up the stairs. I love you. And he said, I love you too. Good luck on your exam. Go, go to school. Right. And 20 minutes later, my, my grandfather had a massive heart attack. And he died. And so I went to, um, I went into, uh, my doctor's appointment and I talked to my doctor. And then at the end of my appointment, that's when my doctor told me that my grandfather had had a heart attack because they couldn't, there was no cell phones then. So they couldn't reach me at school to tell me what had happened to my grandfather. Right. And so this is a man who was on a pedestal. I went fishing with him from the time that I was really little, this knock kneed little girl. I would catch the sunfish that he would use as bait and he'd pay me 10 cents a fish. <laughs> I would cut the grass with him. I would, you know, he taught me how to wire lamps and how to mill things and how to do carpentry. And uh, every night after dinner, when I was a little girl, it was lap time, Papa, right? So he was this hero. And I remember just now what? And I thought, well, I was going to quit school because I didn't know what else to do. I was so, you know, this person's left. What's the point? And I say that because I think a lot of people get that moment in life. Like, what's the point? Yep. And I remember walking into, my family was, was friends with uh, Dr. Purvis, who was the economics professor and head of economics at the time. And I was friends with his son. I remember walking into his office and he said to me, you can quit. You can do that. But that won't bring your grandfather back. That's not going to change anything except for your future. And he goes, I know you're grieving. Think about it come back and see me next week. And I showed up for class. And every day I showed up for class was about making my grandfather proud. So it completely flipped it. Yeah. And then in third year university, that professor died. Wow. He had an accident in Mexico. He was body surfing. And then when he got back, he had an operation and he had a thrombolytic and he died suddenly. And he was the head of our department. And it... It was also devastating. And I just remember the community of people that by that point I had created in my life in the economics department and my friend, uh, Jamie, and all of my friends. Jamie was actually dating one of my girlfriends, one of my close friends at the time. And I just remember us going through this devastating, traumatic experience together. And it really did. He really had a profound impact on me. And it really helped me in some cloudy moments, in some dark times, really get, life is so precious. Life is so precious. You don't know when it's going to be gone. Yeah. It, there were so many situations in my life where, unfortunately, I've lost people. And it seems that you have quite a lot as well. And that you just don't know that moment. And everything changes. I, I am so grateful that you had an opportunity to share your love with your grandfather, mm. to have this moment to treasure with the with, with the professor, to have these things that propel you forward rather than allowing them to push you back. And that encouragement that nothing changes but your future is so powerful. I think I feel I feel like that should be on a shirt, right? Like, like if you if you quit, nothing changes but your future. Right? Exactly. That's that's, a, that's very strong. Where did you go from there? Like you're 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 coming out of economics. You go get this first job, and then and then then you were like, I will sell pharmaceuticals. How in the world do you get from pharmaceuticals to what you do now? So, and just to add one more piece to this story, as I'm going into the pharmaceutical industry and I had begun to, you know, build up this level of confidence, maybe a bit of arrogance, 
Um, but I remember all of that I'll show you. When my dad retired, he was so proud of what he had accomplished and his check, his paycheck. Mm -hmm. And I remember I looked at him and I went, I earn more than you. Wow. I showed him. And what, what, what was that? It was nasty. That was the, I'll show you, also has this other side of it called up yours. Right. I stick it to you. And when I graduated and I'm in the pharmaceutical industry, I was introduced to a transformational coach and consultant. And that's the first time I heard, you know, then I was running and I was, you know, one of the top reps and I was proving myself, but it, there was always this nasty edge. And I ended up with a, a nickname in when I moved into my consulting career and it was called Hurricane Christine. <laughs> okay. Now, you you want to be a force to be reckoned with in life. <laughs> right. But what's the problem with hurricanes? <laughs> they leave a path of destruction. Yeah. So I people don't exactly look forward to having them like come that. through. Exactly. So I had taken all this, I'll prove myself and I'll show you. I kept proving and proving and proving. And the more I proved, the less satisfied, happy, and fulfilled I was. It was like emptiness. And so I was introduced to this, this transformational coach, this transformational consultant in the pharmaceutical industry. And afterwards I said, how do, I said, this is not my seat. How do I do what you do? I'm mm -hmm. curious. And he told me who to study with and where to go. And I went immediately. I didn't pass go. I enrolled. I went immediately to that what that. made you want to do what he did? He started to help me see my patterns of behavior were built on a house of cards. All of the exterior, the pretty outfits, and the way that I put myself together was a shell. And it felt like a very bankrupt shell. And I was waiting for the other shoe to drop all the time. And I didn't have at nearly, the outside had a lot of confidence, but the inside had none. And so when I went on, I, I hired, I hired on and I'd done this program and my coach stood me up in front of 300 people. And he looked at me and he said, until you get this thing with your father complete. He goes, until you solve that, you will continue to create destruction and chaos. And I didn't think I was creating a lot of destruction and chaos except for myself. Right. I was hurting me. And so I remember driving to Kingston. I took the coaching and I drove down to Kingston and I sat at my father's table. I said, I'm coming over. I'm going to see you. And I sat there and I said, dad, do you remember when you left me? And he looked at me and he said, I never left you. He goes, I loved you so much. I was messing up so badly. I needed your grandparents to raise you and you could be the best version of you ever. Mm -hmm. He goes, I could have held on to you like a trophy or I could let you go and have the best life you deserved because we messed up. And it was in that moment, he goes, I loved you enough to let you go changed my entire story. I could no longer be unworthy. I could no longer be unlovable. When, when he said that, were you resistant to that idea or did it just hit you like a ton of bricks? Like, oh my God, that's true. Relief. It was yeah. a relief because I really did have a great life. I, I turned out really well at, up to that point. And since, I'll vote for that. And since. And up to that point, though, I was carrying this burden that wasn't mine to carry because an 11 year old girl made this story up. But right. it was this imaginary it. burden, right? It was a burden, but it felt so real. Right. It defined me. And I wouldn't have been able to be in a committed relationship with another man if I hadn't have solved that. There was no way an unlovable person could celebrate 21 years of marriage that I just celebrated.
Well, congratulations on that. That's awesome. What in that moment when you felt this relief, what, what changed for you? My perception of me and my perception of being valued, valuable and loved. It wasn't true. I was loved. And I didn't have to prove a damn thing to anybody anymore. And I could drop that rock because it was heavy and it was big. And I could then create who do I want to be without that story. And that hurricane, she shows up from time to time. (laughs) (laughs) But I didn't have to leave a path of destruction. I didn't have to have that nasty edge. Right of proving myself and and stepping on people and getting my way. I didn't have to manipulate. I could actually authentically be myself. And I let that all go. And there was a lot of work that needed to be done. Trust me, it didn't happen overnight. It took a long time. But I will say that in completing that with my dad and getting it complete, it allowed me to have a 20-year relationship with him that I otherwise would not have had. And when my dad died, he died very young. He died at 61 years old of skin cancer. And um, I remember my stepmother waited until he went into a coma before she called me. And um, so my husband said to me, just go drive, go and see him. And on his deathbed, so they said he's, he's in a coma, he won't come out. And I sat on the couch beside him and he was in a lot of pain. The cancer had spread and it was in his brain and he opened his eyes when he heard my voice and he said, I love you and I am proud of you. That w- those were his last words to anyone. And he went back into his coma. And so All of the stuff we make up about our parents and ourselves, he did the best he could with what he had on offer. And the only thing I ever needed to know was that he loved me and he was proud of me. It's an incredibly powerful moment. And I I think a message so much for those who are listening that is to... It, it 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 actually connects for me to a, a moment that I heard in counseling at one point, which is to assume the best of others instead of the worst. But it's it's that you're you're taking that a step further and and saying, understand that others are doing the best they can with what they have or know, or who or, or what they've been subjected to, and we don't we don't know their situations. We don't we're we're not them, but if we even just simply assume that they're doing the best they can with what we have. It changes so much. Yeah. Now a six year old kid can't really make that distinction probably, but it is uh, that that is tough. And you've, you've come so far through so much of that journey of, of pain and challenge, but also of love and light. And you, you've had this intertwined rope that seems like, over time, it got stronger and stronger and bound together to allow that redheaded spitfire to, <laughs> to go forth into the world and do amazing things. So you you started down the path of coaching and getting trained and was getting into that business easy for you at that point, like transitioning out of pharmaceuticals and into, I'm going to be a consultant. I'm going to do, because I know you had to call yourself a consultant because of when it was like, was that an easy transition for you or was that complicated? It was complicated. So um, for me, it was easy. What was complicated was it wasn't easy for my family to accept it. Okay. And so here I am in the pharmaceutical industry and I'm training to be a transformational consultant and coach and I'm leading public programs. I was one of the youngest public program leaders by the time I was 24. And when someone was in my seminar who happened to be a very senior level leader at a very large telecommunications company here in Canada, and we built a rapport and he came to me one day and he said, do you think you could do this in my company? And I said, yes, what's your company? Absolutely. (laughs) Of course I can. I love it's the yes, then what's your company? It's not the other way around. What's your company? And so 
he happened to be a senior level leader for one of the largest telecoms here in Canada. And I cut my teeth on consulting. And when I told my family I was leaving my pharmaceutical job, my day job, to become a consultant, they lost it. They thought I joined a cult. I must be crazy. <laughs> what am I doing? You can't do that. You have a six-figure income. You have a car. You have benefits. Just marry a doctor. It'll all turn out. You're living our dream. Stop it. Right. Yeah. That was not their dream for me. They wanted okay. stability. They wanted my life to be safe and secure and happy and stable. Right. So they saw that you were already doing that. And why would you step away I, from I, the dream? Yeah. And but what they didn't know is that I was able to create you know, within six months, I made two years worth of income that right. I was in the pharmaceutical industry. So it really actually worked very well. And uh, they were very proud of me and always have been extremely proud of me um, for building the life that I have. They don't understand it all the time. And once in a while, they'll get a little bit shell-shocked. Well, they might see my face on a billboard in Times Square or a social media post. And they're like, who are you? Really? <laughs> they don't know. My family really doesn't know what I do. Um, my mom, maybe a little bit more so, but my aunt and my grandmother passed uh, two days before. Um, well, actually, two days after I found out I was expecting my first child. Wow. She passed. So, yeah. Oh, so hard. <laughs> 20 years ago this November. I'm yeah. sorry for that loss too. Yeah, it was tough. So you, you jump out there and your family thinks you're nuts, which I, I have some relation to it. Although I did it. I mean, I made that jump five years ago in a space where it was a lot more accepted and I still got a lot of, are you nuts? So that's, I can only imagine what it would have been when you did. Yes. And then, and then you go create success beyond success. And as you did, I'm curious, what would you say is the, across all of this path, what's the biggest obstacle that you had to overcome? Me. You? Me, always. So I had to overcome the unconscious decisions that I had made in my life at an early age. I uh, gained um, some opportunities to self-sabotage. I would get you know, it was like, if things got too good, then I would have so much self doubt, I would crush it. I would stuff it down and put it in a box because there's no way that it could get that good. Mm. Or I would leave it on the table. The other thing is, um, you know, I have a, there's a, a long history of addiction in my family and both my parents have addiction. And there's five year, five generations. So both my parents were um, in, well, my mom's been in recovery for almost 40 years. And my dad, he never did recover um, from his own. He was a high functioning alcoholic, uh, smoked a lot, but he was the life of the party. Everybody loved him. He was very well respected in his industry and in his business, despite what happened at home. He was that go-to fun guy. Right. And um, so there is a lot of that. And I had to struggle myself with those things and and really understand, you know, what what is inherent genetic addiction and how does it play out? And so those were cards that I in my life, I've had to I've had to also battle that. How did you step past those addictions? Uh, one day at a time. Yeah one day at a time. And it wasn't easy, but I have been in recovery for over 16 years and I just celebrated 13 years of full sobriety on Saturday. Congratulations, that's awesome. It, I'm thinking of so many people in our audience who struggle with addictions or who have a, fam a strong family history of addictions. What advice would you give to them or what? where would you maybe point or encourage them? Now here's for me, um, I think the biggest thing is if I was going to have a disease, this is the one I pick because the solution is a spiritual solution based in not being alone and having a community of people who support you. That's a pretty good remedy, right? right. That's a pretty good remedy. As opposed so, to say something that there, you can't heal. You can't heal. Right. And so this is for me, I actually I'm just gratitude is one of the things that I am. I practice all the time. 
and uh, life force being willing to um, put my ego in check, to surrender, to let go of my resentments, to make sure that anything I'm holding on to could cost me everything I want. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to be in recovery to have that. So even the work that I do as a transformational consultant, and I knew all of these things before, like it took me a, l- a while. And, and even my mom thought, you know, you're good. You don't have the gene. You're good. You're fine. And it wasn't until after my daughter was born that it really, my off switch stopped working and it really took on a life of its own. And it took me a little bit of time to get into and understand. And I couldn't outsmart it. I couldn't outwit it. I couldn't outrun it. I couldn't out sit on the top of a mountain. I had to surrender completely and understand and be willing to get help and be willing to do what I needed to do for that. And I don't regret that. And I don't talk about it publicly very often. Um, there's a lot of stigma around um, alcoholism, around recovery, around addiction. But I think also if I don't share it, then people think, oh, she didn't go through anything. I have walked through the through fires you know, through hell and wanting to die because and leave your children because you can't stop drinking is not a party. It's not a good time. No, I I think of our previous guest, Yo Elam, who shared a very similar story and the struggle with, with alcohol, where she wanted to die and leave her children and, and how hard that, how hard that was and how it went on for years. And I, and, and others as well. So I, I applaud you for sharing your story as, as, as is the point of this podcast. I, I believe that our story is the only unique thing we have, and it's the most powerful thing we have. And it's where we have an opportunity to transform others. And it, society is, uh, is challenging in how it evaluates these things, but we speak to those who need to hear. And uh, there are so many that do. Well, and and here's the other coin on that, because I didn't share it for many, many years. It was a very personal phenomenon, and right. I didn't feel comfortable um, letting other people know. But my story does help people who are struggling. Right. And I also have helped many, many women in recovery and many families heal in recovery by sharing myself, by helping. And it's part of my my personal superpower. I don't advertise that. You won't see it on any <laughs> of the billboards or any of the marketing material. But, you know, if you're transforming, you're transforming. If you're transforming, you're transforming. So simple, yet so profound. I love it. What What would you say is maybe the biggest lesson you learned along the way? Hmm. Just never give up. Just keep going. You know, it's kind of like that Winston Churchill quote. I think he said this. Um, one of these people said it. Uh, when you're going through hell, don't pitch a tent. Keep going. Keep going, right. Just yeah. keep going. And it's not easy. But I think understanding that we're not alone. Everybody has their journey. It may not be as challenging as the next. It may be harder. We've all had something. And no one gets out alive. None of us are escaping right, right, our right. human our human beingness. There are a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to this show, and I always like to share resources if there are any that really connect. Are there any books or podcasts or people that you would say to our audience, hey, look, if, if you're out there, you're an entrepreneur, you're trying to do your thing, read this, follow this, listen to this. Is there anything that jumps to your mind? Mm, there are so many. That's the problem. I'm a lifelong learner. Me so, too. you know, I think the thing that I would encourage anyone to do is, is get a coach. So whether it's a speaking coach, a business coach, I listen to coaching as part of the way forward. And I have five coaches. I, when I reinvented my business, so I retired in 2012 when we had our third child, um, actually 2013, we had him and I was out of pocket for a good three years out of the marketplace. And so when I returned in 2017, I hired a coach. So, you know, uh, and JT Fox is my coach today and, and he, he has a good book. He's got a lot of content out there. You can find content anywhere. It's what are you, are you mind fitting? What are you willing 
to open yourself up to and what are you willing to change? Mm. So there isn't one. There's so many. And if you can see like all of these books I have read, right? <laughs> that's just one shelf. There's shelves and shelves and shelves of books and podcasts and audio. I am a constant life learner. I am the same. And I, I love... I love the answer and the connection to figure out what are you willing to open yourself up to? What are you willing to change and, and maybe begin homing in from there? We know your dream from when you were a little girl and we've talked about that. What, what are your dreams now? If you look out three, four, five years from now, what are your dreams? So I do not want to be the first woman prime minister of Canada. Not anymore. No, thank you very much. I do think <laughs> the world needs a lot of leadership. That isn't the leadership I'm going to be providing. <laughs> and and here's the truth. I fell in love with what I do at a very early age. And this is it. I wouldn't change my career. I change sometimes how I do that. So whether it's speaking to larger audiences, um, but my dream is really to be able to continue to make an impact until I am used up and they plant me in the ground. That's it. That's a great quote. I want to make an impact till I'm used up and they plant me in the ground. Bring it. That's a, that's like a, that's a mic drop moment for sure, but we're going to continue anyway. Um, <laughs> when, when you think about the, the, the description even of or the name even of this podcast, Dreams Are Real. It, it's based upon a phrase, an idea, a concept, but I find it means different things to different people. What does Dreams Are Real mean to you? Hmm. I, I really stand firm in if you can dream it, you can do it. So if you can dream it and you put enough action and heart and soul and attention, you can have that dream be a reality. And when people flip this question around, I, I, I always love to do this part in it, and you're, you're a great example of this, but when people flip it around and they look at you and they say, you, where you are now without doing more, you are a living, eminent example, proof in front of us that dreams are real. How does that make you feel? Hmm. I think I have a hard time digesting it because I'm not done yet. <laughs> and as, as much as I've accomplished in my very windy and extraordinary career, I know there's still more and I love what I do. So I get to just do more of it. I think that's probably a good place for us to aim towards the end. And it, so as we begin to wrap up, is there a certain thought or message that you'd like to leave with our audience? I, I do believe if we're going to pull the thread on dreams, you can always dream a new dream. You can always reinvent who you are and you don't have to be stuck in your past. It doesn't dictate your future unless you want it to. How can our audience connect? What are you working on that they should know about? Where can they yeah. find you? So I am working on a book. It will be launched by the end of this year. It is on reinvention, courageous leadership. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Coach C Official. You can find me on LinkedIn at Christine Nielsen. And my company is Contrast Results. That is awesome. Your story and your light are powerful and vibrant in the world. I thank you so much for taking the time to share with us and to connect with us and to just bring your goodness into our audience. Thank you. I am so grateful that you asked me and that we connected on that very serendipitous day. And I do believe in serendipity and I do believe that like minds will find each other. I do as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Thank you for joining us on the Dreams Are Real podcast. If anything we've said has inspired you to dream bigger, live more boldly, or move closer to your ideal life, please reach out and let us know, and also be sure to share this episode with a friend. We would be honored if you would like, subscribe, and leave a review for our show on your favorite podcasting platform. And for more discussion of this episode and all things related to the Dreams Are Real podcast, and to receive your free download of Dan's Defining Your North Star training, please join our Dreams Are Real community on Facebook. Until next time, be amazing and keep crushing it.